Hello, everyone. Um, we're waiting for the Zoom webinar to populate with people. It takes about 30 to 45 seconds. So hold on a second, then we'll, we'll start. Just a few more people looks like are being added. So then we'll start up in just a few seconds. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Zed Adams, the chair of the philosophy department here at the New School for Social Research. And I'm very happy to be welcoming you all to another session of our summer talk series that we've called the current moment perspectives from the social sciences and humanities. I'm joined today by uh, Miranda Young, who's a PhD student in the philosophy department, and Chiara Bodici, who's gonna be giving our talk, which I'll, who I'll introduce in just a second. Before I do that, I wanna say that we're planning on adding an additional meeting on Monday, June 29th to discuss the Black Lives Matter movement. And so look uh, for that. We're still finalizing the details on that. In terms of structure, we have the chat window alongside the, on the side of the Zoom uh, window. If you open that up, we're gonna heartily encourage people today to utilize that chat function during the talk itself. We think it might provide a kind of nice parallel conversation for the attendees. And then that might uh, also spur some wonderful uh, questions for the Q&A after. For the Q&A itself, We'll have the chat window open, but then we'll also have the Q&A. There's a separate Q&A window. Everything's very complicated on Zoom. There's a separate Q&A window. Please write your questions into that. And that's where we'll be fielding text questions from. We're also gonna field um, verbal questions. If you'd like to ask your question in person, as it were, please raise your hand in the participants section. So all of that said, I'm very, very uh, happy to be welcoming a uh, fellow member of the philosophy department, Kara Bodici. She's associate professor of philosophy, and she's also the director of the gender studies program. Kiara today is gonna to be talking on a project that she's been working on for a while. The title of her talk is Anarcho-Feminism in Times of COVID. So I hope you'll join me in this kind of silently welcoming uh, Kiara today. Thanks. Welcome, Kiara. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, let's, I will try to speak with slides as it seems to um, be helpful when trying to cover a very broad uh, topic in a short amount of time. So I hope this can be helpful for people following. Okay, so uh, why anarcho-feminism? So to begin with, uh, a few definitions uh, that hopefully will also help us to uh, clear the way uh, out of possible misunderstanding. So to begin with, um, these are tentative preliminary definition and we can go back to that, but it's important to delineate the conceptual space because whenever one hears the word anarchism, particularly today, there's a lot of assumptions uh, that come in um, and are misleading, and we try to argue why. So to begin with, with, anarchy does not mean by itself absence of an order. It doesn't mean by itself chaos, uh, even less so destruction. Uh, the technical term anarchy means absence of an arche, where the term arche from ancient Greek uh, is the term denoting either uh, overarching principle, government, or a leader. So consequently, we can broadly approach anarchism as a philosophy that sees different forms of domination as reinforcing each other so that you cannot oppose one form of domination without opposing all the others because they risk reinstating another form of arche. 
Uh, it's what Bakunin called the indivisibility of freedom, and we'll come back to that. So at this point, one may say, fine, you want to give us this technical definition of anarchism. Why can't we stick with, uh, let's say, Donald Trump definition or uh, the common uh, sense definition of anarchy as just synonymous of chaos and order? The problem, there's nothing wrong with uh, um, uh, common definition, common sense definition, but in this case, there is a big loss uh, uh, for um, social scientists and philosophers alike, and it's the loss of a con concept uh, that enable us to define experiences of a social order without an order. So uh, it um, prevents us, if we simply use anarchy as synonymous of chaos, to understand and to focus on those experiences, on those societies uh, where order, and in particular social order, has been possible even in the absence of a government or a leader. So uh, this is for uh, anarchism and, um, wait, uh, how about feminism? So uh, again, Tentatively, by feminism here, I do not mean uh, fight for equality with men. Uh, most often, uh, this turned down to be equality with white men, but rather struggle against oppression. Um, and if following here uh, the definition of bell hooks, but uh, the list uh, of uh, feminists who have defined feminism as a struggle against the oppression uh, of women as opposed to fight for equality is much longer. So why, uh, whose oppression, oppression of women, but I would also say of feminized bodies uh, more in general. And the reason for this focus is that no matter which axis of oppression we look at, where it's race, class, empire, ableism, women, and people perceived as femina more in general are always at the bottom. That's what statistics tell us. And that's what COVID-19 proved. While women constitute 77% of healthcare workers uh, and have been the, for the forefront of the fight against uh, COVID-19, they've also been paying quite a high price for that. Uh, according to the UN Population Fund, uh, the raise in gender violence caused by the lockdown is calamitous. Uh, indeed, as we know from the global population, there are already 126 million missing girls, meaning uh, women uh, and uh, feminized bodies in general, that went missing from the global population just as a consequence of feminicide uh, and gender violence. Now, these numbers, uh, according to the UN population found, are skyrocketing at the moment because of the lockdown, which implies not only the women are locked in their household, which is not very often a safe place for them, but also the women do not have access under lockdown to the structures of health outside of uh, their household. So if the problem is women and feminized body, why not just feminism? Because feminism is not enough and it is conceptually compatible with domination. We have, uh, as an example, Betty Friedan, uh, author of uh, a very important uh, book for um, US feminism, The Feminine Mystique, arguing that feminism means attaining equality with men in the struggle for power. So by definition, feminism is compatible not only with the state, but also with capitalism and even racism. There's nothing in itself that prevents us from uh, attaining uh, the emancipation of some women at the expense of other ones. Another example of why feminism is uh, compatible with domination uh, is uh, uh, our forms of uh, um, radical feminism, such as Sally Miller Gehart, who argued that it's time has come to replace patriarchy with matriarchy. 
So the exchange women have suffered oppression for so long that we should just flip the coin and exchange the oppression of some again with the oppression of others. Now, in contrast to uh, a feminism that stand alone, uh, if we combine feminism with uh, uh, the anarchism emphasis on the, the indivisibility of freedom, we come to the conclusion that we can rethink feminism through the inside. There is no arche explaining the oppression of women, but rather a plurality of axes of oppressions all mutually reinforcing each other. And that therefore, in order to fight the oppression, of, the oppression of women, we need to also fight all the other forms of oppression. In particular, I think that um, combining uh, anarchism with feminism, and so with a specific emphasis on feminism, is also important uh, because uh, Despite the fact that uh, queer theory and gender theory have done a very important work in order to dismantle uh, different forms of uh, uh, oppression generated by uh, gender uh, binarism, cis normativity, heteronormativity, we need to stick to uh, feminism. Um, and we need to stick to a form of feminism that fights the oppression of women and all bodies that are perceived as being women, um, because this does not automatically get addressed uh, in queer and trans theory. So uh, if there's one thing that we have uh, learned from the rise of uh, uh, extreme um, right-wing populism and new forms of fascism is that there can be people like Milo Yiannopoulos who support gay men rights and even queer men rights and still be a misogynist. So at this point one can say fine we need to address the multi a multiplicity of axes of oppression. Why not intersectionality? And indeed, COVID-19 has shown uh, how timely and, intersection, and important an intersectional analysis is. Uh, I've mentioned that uh, women were at the forefront of the COVID-19. Um, even more so, data shows how much uh, people, of, women of color and Black uh, women have paid the price for COVID-19. Uh, being not only at the forefront of care work, but also often occupying the lowest uh, strata uh, in, uh, um, in the labor market within the healthcare, with some of them uh, having uh, very low wages or not even being recognized for the work they do. Do they get visibility? Has the COVID led? to the visibility and the importance of the work that women are doing, yes and no. For instance, uh, on May uh, 31st, uh, Rainy Nishwan Scott, as uh, uh, the streets were flooded uh, with uh, um, uh, the rightful outrage for the death of uh, George Floyd, she wrote, Breonna's murders have yet to be arrested. And I wonder whether that is in part because we are not as collectively outraged for her as we have been for Ahmod and George. That's an alarming thought, but I'm running down the list of possibility. And it can't be because we are already exhausted about Ahmod because we are now fighting for George. It also can't be because there's no video footage of her murder, because we had no problem standing up for Trayvon Martin and Freddie Gray. I, for one, am tired of fighting for the world to see my humanity as a Black person while simultaneously yelling for Black people to see that the life of Black women are in danger too. Now, this was written on, on May 31st, uh, where the case of Breonna Taylor was not yet at the forefront. Things have changed ever since, but I think have changed ever since also because um, women have been speaking up. So 
although I would say intersectionality is very important uh, and indeed is important both as a, an activist program, uh, that was the original meaning of the term intersectionality. It was a, a, an activist program, uh, program rooted in black feminism. Uh, ever since it has become this uh, sort of buzzword. So every, everybody is intersectional and everything is intersectional. Um, and I think this has led to a use, but also a misuse of intersectionality as a theoretical tool. But I would argue that it's a misuse that is also, uh, is also somehow listed in a problem uh, with uh, uh, turning intersectionality and the for an activist um, program directly into a, a theory. Uh, and the problem for this are twofold. First, intersectionality cannot but generate a list of axes of oppression. And all lists are, um, have a, presents a twofold problem, that they're always incomplete, but also potentially infinite. And we have seen it in book titles and what I would call the syndrome of the list. So we go from Angela Davis, Women, Race and Class, uh, published in the 80s, which is an intersectional title in the spirit, to you know, more recent titles where in order to be more and more intersectionals, we have kept adding other axes of oppression. So Brooke Holmes, Mark Bodies, list gender, race, class, age, disability, and disease. But again, even if this list is very long, it's still incomplete. Why not uh, beauty? Why not ableism? So the problem with intersectionality, as I see it, is that it cannot by generate lists that are always uh, uh, potentially endless, but also always incomplete. Um, and then we lose the importance of the focus on uh, women's battle. And so why women? Now, everybody is intersectional. Um, so what happened to the women's cause? An anarcho-feminist philosophy as rooted in the anarcho-feminist uh, tradition of women's battle can on the contrary keep together the two following claims. That there is something specific about the oppression of women, thus justifying the term feminism, and that in order to fight this form of oppression, you have to fight all other forms of oppression, which is, as I've tried to mention, uh, the fundamental insight of anarchism. Now, I don't have the time here to reconstruct uh, the very long uh, tradition of uh, anarcho-feminist uh, um, thinking and uh, battles, both in the West and outside of the West. Uh, so I will just mention some examples um, that may be known um, to the people who are listening. Uh, one is Bakunin collectivist anarchism, in particular, is claimed that even a state of proletarians will be as oppressive as any other state. And I think the critique of the state is very important when it comes to uh, gender and sexuality, because it is through the state apparatus that we are all assigned at birth a gender identity, and it is through the state apparatus that this gender identity remains attached to us. Uh, unless we transition and unless we're lucky enough to live uh, in a state that enable uh, such a thing. But Bakunin, in my view, is also an interesting figure because uh, despite not um, being often uh, mentioned in, in the list of you know, feminist thinker, it did emphasize that you cannot abolish um, oppression in, of women, but also uh, oppression in general without abolishing the, uh, the patriarchal authority. Uh, something that was part of his uh, daily battles, uh, Marx called him uh, an hermaphrodite because of that and because of his uh, open uh, relationship uh, with his uh, partner. Uh, so there's a long tradition um, which goes back in the West 
to the split inside the, the um, international, um, the first international between the Marxist and, and the, the anarchist. Uh, in, in the US, we can mention uh, Emma Goldman, important uh, anarcha um, communist remarks, uh, and her emphasis on how class, state, and patriarchy converge in creating what she calls the women tragedy. Uh, in, in her analysis, she also focused, whereas Bakunin looks more at state and external authority, she focuses on what she calls the worst tyrant, that is the tyrant inside. But what is important in my view, and particularly timely about the anarcho-feminist tradition, is that uh, it also enables us to think and construct a philosophical tradition outside of uh, methodological uh, Eurocentrism. And why do I say so? Because there is indeed a very vital um, anarcho-feminist traditions that began outside of the West uh, and also uh, independently of that. Um, here I can quote, uh, for instance, uh, Hitchin work, um, uh, her text, uh, The Problems of Women Liberation, which has been particularly uh, influential in the Chinese anarcho-feminist movement. A movement that actually draws more from Taoist philosophy uh, than from uh, Western sources. I read from her work. The majority of women are already oppressed by both the government and by men. The electoral system simply increases their oppression by introducing a third ruling group, elite women. Even if the oppression remains the same, the majority of women are still taken advantage by the minority of women. When a few women in power dominate the majority of powerless women, an equal class differentiation is brought into existence among women. If the majority of women do not want to be controlled by men, why do they want to be controlled by women? Therefore, instead of competing with men for power, women should strive for overthrowing men's rule. Once men are stripped of their privilege, they will become the equal of women. There will be no submissive women nor submissive men. This is the liberation of women. And I'm quoting this text because I think it importantly emphasizes also uh, that there cannot be a liberation of women uh, by just suppressing men. So part, by substituting patriarchy with matriarchy, we're not gonna get into any better place. Uh, liberation of women means no submissive women nor submissive men, meaning that and I move here to what I think is the main anarcho feminist inside. Feminists cannot mean the liberation of uh, some people. Right? It cannot mean the liberation of some women, nor I would say of the 99% of them. It has to mean the liberation of all of them. Uh, all women have to be included, which of course does not mean they cannot be. Um, any progress unless all and every single body on the planet uh, who is identifying and identify themselves as women are actually free. But I mean that this has to be the goal uh, towards which uh, a, a feminist program should lead. Uh, I can also mention uh, that this, uh, an important anarcho-feminist moment, moment was in the US, the 1970s, uh, and in particular, the movement um, within uh, second wave feminists that uh, feminized the concept. Uh, so emphasized the importance of speaking of an anarcha feminist and not simply uh, anarchist feminism or, or uh, feminist uh, anarchism. For instance, Peggy Corniger uh, wrote, Feminist does not mean female corporate power or a woman president. It means no corporate power and no president. Thereby meaning that if we just select a woman president, we're not necessarily doing any good uh, to uh, the women cause. Actually, we actually 
end up in a situation where some women uh, are attaining their supposed emancipation at the expense of creating other full other layers of oppression for other women. Uh, I think also uh, in the current uh, feminist wave, uh, there is an important anarcha-feminist uh, moment. Um, for instance, uh, the, the whole movement, Ni Una Menos, literally not one less, uh, very much um, convey the sense of this main anarcha-feminist insight that you cannot be free as a woman unless all of them are free because any oppression against any single act of woman, any single woman who has gone missing is, takes away somehow uh, the freedom of everybody. So it's an act of what we can call women gender side. And therefore, uh, it will come back to us in the form of the oppression of women as a gender. So to sum up on this part, uh, why anarcho-feminism? Because whereas feminism can go hand in hand with domination, anarchism opposes all forms of domination. So anarcho-feminism means fighting the oppression of women while fighting against all forms uh, of oppression. Now, in the time that is remaining, I would like to raise uh, the remaining question, which is, okay, how do we define womanhood? I mean, you've talked so much about women. How can we define womanhood without creating father hierarchies? Uh, for instance, without creating father hierarchies, including heteronormativity, cis normativity, so the exclusion of bodies uh, who um, may perceive themselves as women but are not perceived as such. Uh, or uh, as we've seen in the case of race, how can we make sure that some uh, women do not attain their emancipation at the expense of others? So here is where I uh, would argue, and here we get more in the technical philosophical part of the talk. Um, we need to move to a different social ontology, which I summarize in uh, the slogan, from individuality to trans individuality. Okay, so what is uh, trans individuality? So I'm drawing here inspiration from uh, Etienne Balibar interpretation of Spinoza's ethics, and in particular his argument that uh, Spinoza's individuality must be understood always as a form of trans individuality. So properly speaking, individuals do not exist, they have never existed, they only exist as trans individuality. Now, uh, we can go back to this uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, the Q&A, but um, I would like just to point out what are the main uh, feature of, of this ontology inspired by uh, Spinoza, but also, um, and, and Balibar reading of Spinoza, but also by uh, feminist writers um, such as Moira Gattens and other uh, feminists who have been inspired by uh, Spinoza's philosophy. So the starting point is the idea of an infinite unique substance expressing itself through an infinity of attributes of which only thought and extension are accessible to us. Um, so the corollary of this, on, of this uh, starting point is that ideas and things are not two different substances, but the same thing, just seen through in different ways. So just seen through different attributes. So in this ontology, there is, it's based on this uh, distinction between the substance as what is in itself and is conceived through itself, and precisely for this definition, it cannot but be one and unique, uh, and modes, where modes are affections of the substance, that is, that which is in another through which it is also conceived. So the substance is what is there, what is in itself, and is conceived through itself, but 
prop it expresses itself through modes individual things uh, and we can go back to this in the discussion but uh, we can say that properly speaking only uh, individual things exist the corollary of this is also that we are all mode of the same substance so there is no a priori ontological difference between human beings and animals or even stones uh, precisely because every form of materiality, uh, as we've seen in the first uh, um, idea of an infinite unique substance, is already imbued with some form of mental activity. For those of you who are in philosophy, uh, this may seem like a strange idea that every form of materiality is endowed with some form of mental activity. Uh, but actually, pump psychism uh, is uh, becoming very big even in neuroscience nowadays. So there's a uh, room for arguing that Spinoza's strange ontology, according to which wherever there is matter, there is also some form of mental activity, is not uh, so bizarre. Or better, it may be bizarre, but it may also be true. So to, to, to move on this point, what does this mean? It means that individuals are never individuals in the sense of given object that cannot be divided, but they're always trans individual because they are processes and not objects, and because they only exist in the network of relations that constitute them, therefore not as independent substances. How are individuals created? through mechanism of affective association that occur at the inter, intra, and supra-individual level. Think, for instance, of how our bodies come into being through an inter-individual encounter, how they are shaped by supra-individual forces, such as their geographical location, and how they are made up by intra-individual bodies, such as the air we breathe, the bacteria that inhabit our body or the hormones we take. We may add the virus that all become alive when they are in our body. Corollaries of this definition. First of all, we can, if we define women individuality uh, uh, as a trans individual process as opposed to object or uh, even worse, substances, um, we can use the concept of woman outside of any heteronormative and binary framework, so as to include all type of women, AFAB women, AMAB women, trans women, queer women, so on and so forth. And AFAB women uh, is, is the term used in LGBTQ plus communities to denote women who have been assigned a uh, female uh, sex at birth. Second, so it's, it's a much more inclusive uh, definition of uh, uh, womanhood. Second, precisely because in this ontological framework, uh, there is uh, no position uh, between bodies and minds, there is also no position between nature and culture or between nature and society. And as uh, uh, those of you who are familiar with the anarcho-feminist tradition will know, most forms of uh, anarcho-feminism of the past have also been very close to eco-feminism. Uh, so um, forms of feminism that see the liberation of women only possible in conjunction uh, with uh, um, an attention to uh, ecological disasters, which nowadays uh, are still very much uh, on the timeline. So, can we use this trans individual philosophy to rethink what uh, Paul Preciado called somatic communism? And has not COVID actually given us a new insight into what is, could be this form of somatic communism. 
Let me start, uh, this is reaching toward the conclusion, uh, from the current um, starting point. Up until COVID-19, most of uh, social science research, most of even imaginaries uh, and uh, common understanding of what the world looked like was in my view very much imbued with some form of methodological individualism. What do I mean by methodological individualism? I mean that we tend to conceive the world and look around ourselves according to the dichotomy individuals versus society. So there are human beings, individuals, they may be good, they may be bad for each other, uh, they may be good or they may be bad for the society they're part of, and then the rest is just the environment. And so the rest is just something outside of us. I think that what COVID-19 has made clear as uh, we wonder about the air we breathe and whether uh, that was safe for us, as we wonder about the surfaces we touch, as we wondered about whether we had the virus or not, whether the bacteria in our body uh, were a good or a bad ally um, for fighting uh, our battles. I think it made clear that the environment is not outside of us. The environment is us. The environment is the air we breathe, the food we eat, um, and in particular, the fact that we cannot be healthy uh, on our own. We cannot get fed on our own, but we can also not um, avoid uh, what I would call a, a form of somatic communism. That is the fact that our body not simply depend on others, not simply depend on essential workers, not simply depend on the air we breathe and the food we eat, uh, the others are literally constitutive of our own beings. People have spoken about the webs of life, uh, the mesh, uh, interdependence. I think we can call this the indivisibility of freedom, uh, as it's rooted in the fact that in order to reproduce life, we need some form of communism. Uh, I call this somatic uh, communism to say that uh, whereas one may think that communism is an ideal to come, uh, and indeed it may be in terms of a critique of a system based on private property, they make us blind to the already existing communism. Uh, I think that COVID-19 made largely clear that somatic communism is not something to be realized, but is something that is already living with us. Will this transition from methodological individualism to somatic communism usher a new image of the world? That I don't know, but what I know is that as a matter of fact, if not the image of the world, at least the world itself seems to be changing in the U.S. streets uh, these days. Thank you. Thanks, Chiara. That was really wonderful. So I'm going to jump right into the questions. Um, Shannon has a question that's echoed by some of the other uh, attendees about other forms of feminism that don't seem to have gotten much discussion yet. In specific, she asks about Marxist feminism. And she said, you know, so Marxist feminism has a long history of giving structural analyses that uh, take into account race and global divisions of labor. And so she'd like to hear your views on how anarcho-feminism and Marxist feminism are similar, but also where the real differences are between them. Right. So, um, yes, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, a lot of figure uh, inside of the anarcho feminist tradition are uh, liminal. I mean, the, the Princess Maria Mies uh, is considered both a, a Marxist feminist and an anarcho feminist. And uh, uh, this goes back to really the origins of, uh, of the feminist movement, where I think that 
in the same way in which anarchism, anarchists and Marxists very largely converge. So uh, let's say, um, particularly because uh, a lot of anarchists were communists themselves. A lot of anarchists were also Marxist uh, themselves. So there is a convergence uh, in a lot of the analysis uh, that uh, are put forward by anarcho-feminists like Emma Goldman. There's a lot of convergence with uh, Marxist feminism. So what is different is really this emphasis on the fact that you cannot fight one form of oppression without fighting all of them. So there are forms of Marxist feminism that argue, not all of them, but some of them argue that um, in order you can bring back the oppression of women to um, class exploitation uh, or forms of, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, exploitations where they're rooted in, uh, um, in extraction of surplus value from labor force or uh, extraction of uh, um, surplus value uh, from uh, unpaid work. Uh, some uh, Marxist feminists argue that if you solve that forms of exploitation, then you solve uh, the problem of oppression of women. Against that, and some are Marxist feminists see, for instance, um, the liberation of women being compatible with the existence of the state. Hmm? Anarcha-feminists, on the contrary, they say you can't even a state of proletarians, like even a communist state, a state that declares itself communist, uh, can be a source of oppression for women because the state itself has a structural apparatus that is based on uh, a minority ruling over a majority of people will reimpose bureaucratic structure and we see it every day on our uh, identity papers that reinscribes some form of oppression. Yeah, so Eugene already has a follow-up question on this, which is, does that uh, imply that you think there are problems inherent to Marxism itself that prevent Marxism from giving us the kind of feminism that you think is adequate to, uh, you know, challenge these forms of oppression? I don't think there's a problem with Marxism itself. I mean, Marx and Marxism, I mean, they did their job in criticizing uh, class struggle. I think there's a problem in trying to reduce feminism to Marxism. Okay, good. Well, then here's a, uh, another question about how this view compares and contrasts to other views out there. Diana would like to hear more about how it compares and contrasts to feminisms that have emerged, emerged from the third world. So she, she refers to, you know, third world feminisms, black feminism, um, uh, that do not advocate for matriarchy and recognize the interconnectedness of life. Um, I mean, here's the, here's the strong way in which Diana puts her worry. She worries uh, about introducing new terminology to ideas that are already in existence as yeah. a form of Eurocentric colonizing of discourses that have emerged already as part of the opposition to oppression. Right, yes. I mean, uh, that's, largely, um, that, that's largely the case. So a lot of, uh, so this is a point, a lot of anarcho-feminism like uh, He Chen, um, Chinese anarcho-feminism, actually have been using a reading the word anarcho-feminism and doing a form of analysis of uh, uh, um, the oppression of women from the standpoint of uh, um, not simply the West and uh, uh, Eurocentric theories, but from the point of view of, uh, that's really what is typical of anarcho feminist the globe first. Mm. So from the point of view of an attention to mechanism of production and reproduction of life that happens through the globe. It's not a chance also that a lot of, um, um, by the way, a lot of anarchists and anarcho-feminists were either geographers or anthropologists. So people who were studying process of uh, production and reproduction of life independently of state boundaries, and the four also independently of uh, methodological nationalism. 
And indeed, yes, sure, uh, this can be said, okay, uh, a lot of uh, um, post-colonial uh, feminists have been arguing very similar things. Uh, I, I, a lot of black feminists have been putting forward intersectional analysis, they point in the same direction. And I'm, yes, I mean, fine, like, you know, the more the merrier. Uh, the problem, in my view, is not, um, so much that of colonizing by adding another word uh, in the sense that then this is a concept that has been outside there. The problem is in literally hearing all the different voices. Uh, uh, Hechen, for instance, work uh, exists only in Chinese. Um, not all the work has been translated in English. Uh, I've read it in a French uh, translation there are only, only some parts of the work have been translated. So I would say in, in the anarcho-feminist inside that you cannot fight the oppression of women without fighting all the other forms of oppression, it is also implicit that Eurocentrism um, is a form of oppression. So if we make feminism just a theory made by white uh, women in the West, for the rest of the globe, we are not really proposing a form of feminism, but in my view, we're proposing a form of elitism. So again, we're back to the freedom only for some women, not for all of them. Okay. And I think that this is, in, here is the point, in a time when uh, we have all these data, uh, global data, in a times where, uh, not simply have global data, but in a times where COVID-19 makes clear that uh, we are traveling, we are constantly moving around the globe. Not only we are moving, but speeches themselves are moving. We know COVID was uh, the boundary between animal and the human world is not as fixed as we thought it was. It's very porous. Um, the globe is not simply one. We knew it was one. We have been knowing it was one for a while but it's experienced now as one. Because if there's a, a pandemic in China, it's, it's, it's going to be uh, at some point here as well, right? So I think that more than the problem of which term you're using, the question is the concept we are using and the voices we are trying to make her. Okay, great. So here's a very, this, uh, uh, provokes an interesting big picture question from Rob, which is, so if we, you know, follow through on this idea of um, eliminating distinctions and eliminating hierarchies, Rob's question seems appropriate. Rob wants to know, is all hierarchy op oppressive? Um, and if not, how do you distinguish distinctions that are not oppressive, hierarchies that are not oppressive from hierarchies that are oppressive. What's the basis upon which you would distinguish them? Okay, you are, you are cheating because you, you have two questions and <laughs> both are huge. So one is the question of distinction uh, and the other is that of hierarchy. Uh, so I don't think that all distinctions are by themselves hierarchical. And uh, uh, this is why I think, uh, although the project is also in conversation with queer theory, the problem that I see with queer theory and queer ecology in particular is the fact that there's a very strong critique of boundary thinking. Uh, but what do we do once we eliminate all the boundaries? I mean, does it mean that there's no boundaries between human animals, animate and inanimate life? Now, I think in, in a, within an ontology of the trans individual, we can say precisely because it is an ontology of, of, that does not deny the existence of individuals. We can still say, yes, there are individuals, but they are trans individual in their very ontology. So we can maintain a distinction and we can say that there's a difference between humans and animals but this does not imply an ontological hierarchy. So there is 
implicit, I think already in Spinoza's ontology, despite uh, his negative remarks on animals, for instance, there is already a sort of ecocentric egalitarianism within this ontology because thinking is everywhere. Uh, mental activity is everywhere. We can't just say that uh, we can destroy the entire planet uh, or inanimate forms of life uh, because we as human endow with consciousness have some sort of superiority. So I would say that precisely the concept of trans individuality enable us to keep distinctions without turning them into hierarchies. Okay, good. So in response, you're right, there were two questions there. In response to the second question, do you want to hold on to the idea that, that we should abolish all hierarchies, that there's no distinction between oppressive and non-oppressive hierarchies? So I don't, again, is not, I don't think that it's um, uh, all hierarchies. I mean, certainly hierarchies are more likely to generate oppression than others. Uh, but for me, the problem is not hierarchies per se, but it's oppression. Like, let's say, uh, we can say that there's a form of um, uh, hierarchy between people of an older age, uh, and that as such, I myself respect that. I respect the idea that people of an older age may have lived longer than myself and therefore have uh, more insightful um, you know, insightful um, things to say about life, right? So I can recognize some form of hierarchy there. Is that automatically oppressive? No, I don't think so. The question is when the hierarchies become oppressive. Mm -hmm. uh, and the point is that when you have a minority ruling over a, a large uh, majority of people, in the case of feminist battles, this has always resulted into forms of oppression. So even in, in cases where uh, some, some form of uh, um, emancipation has been achieved by some women, there have been other forms of oppression uh, that have been reinstated. So for instance, in the case of care work, right? Uh, who is doing uh, the care work uh, for uh, white women who are going um, and uh, uh, join uh, the labor force. Most often is uh, uh, shadow work uh, by um, racial racialized uh, bodies. Uh, sorry, I was muted. Uh, <laughs> that was helpful. I'm going to call on Miranda now uh, to ask a question or two. Yeah. Uh Thank you, Kiara. So I, I think this idea is really interesting. I have lots of questions, but I also want to make sure to sort of tie in one of my questions with what's being talked about in this like very lively chat and Q and A. Um, so I guess my question is relates to your critique of intersectional intersectional feminism or intersectionality, um, and I think I kind of want to sort of echo what I'm seeing from uh, Abram and Vita's question. Um, in that, so if I see one of the strengths coming out of intersectionality as a concept, and I think coming out of some contemporary Marxist critical race theorists, is that there's something significant about paying particular attention to like each logic of domination. So intersectionality and in, in sort of your critique of the list was really impactful because it sort of like dignified these different logics of domination, but differentiated them. Um, and that was, I think, talking about it in relation to its practical activist use is really is a good way to think of it as well, because then it allowed activists to sort of mobilize and strategize while sort of, you can con contain a kind of like broader intersectional critique, but you could focus say like on an anti-racist effort. So what I'm saying is like, it seems like there's something important at times to hold race as distinct. Um, and I, my, I guess I would be worried a little bit and maybe you had kind of brought this up and maybe you could go a little bit more into it 
about the trans individuality, we lose some of that. Um, and I'm, again, like, I think you had started to go into this, but I would love to hear a little bit more about it. Um, so, yeah. Yes. Yeah, th thank you for your question. No, um, because it enables me to uh, clarify what I mean here. Um, my, I, I do believe that the importance of intersectionality has been uh, as, as, a, as an activist program, but also as a research tool, uh, in particular in empirical uh, researches, has been to say there's something particular that happens at certain intersection. Because uh, we've seen in the case of uh, you know, Breonna Taylor, being a woman of color does not simply mean to be oppressed as a woman, plus to be oppressed as a woman of color, and then you just put the two together, it means that there's something that happens at that intersection, which is what I've tried to convey uh, with uh, uh, the, the quotation um, I, I mentioned. Um, the problem is that if we simply, uh, when we want to build a, a philosophical framework, and I mean, I still uh, have a, um, perhaps it's a, a philosophical perversion for uh, generality, I don't know, fine, maybe non-philosopher uh, don't share that worry with me. Um, but the, when you want to turn that into a philosophical framework, I think it doesn't automatically capture uh, what you can capture uh, on the contrary when beginning from an ontology of a trans individuality that shows from the beginning that every individual, every individuality is exposed to this network of uh, relations that not simply are important because you can say, fine, you know, uh, I want my freedom and emancipation as, as a black woman and that's great, right? How, and you've, how do we then add ecology? How do we account for the fact that there's a, a connection between not only the oppression of women, but also uh, racism uh, and, and what is called environmental racism? Right? So my answer to this is to say, instead of adding sources of oppression, uh, economic exploitation, uh, cultural uh, prejudices, um, racist stereotypes, um, environmental disaster. Why don't we try to address all of them through a philosophical framework that enable us to keep them together from the very beginning instead of having to add yet another item. Now, this may be a project uh, just for philosophers. I, I don't think so because I take the term from uh, um, you know, ongoing social movement. Um, although I have to say in the ongoing social movement is usually preferred the term anarchistics, feministics, where uh, uh, the um, uh, woman, uh, the A is uh, um, turning to an X in order to be more inclusive. Besides the fact that I find it unpronounceable, uh, I always ins I insist on the anarcha feminism precisely because I think that um, it is primarily a form of feminism, so I don't want to lose um, the feminist part of the battle um, into the rest. So I see, although I understand your question, I mean, I, it's great. There's nothing wrong with intersectionality, and uh, um, it's great the research uh, is being done on that, uh, around that term, and it can be useful for emphasizing the specific logic that emerges as a single uh, interactions. But for a philosophical project, I also find particularly useful to look at those particular as the result of a more underlying um, social ontology. If we approach intersectionality through methodological individualism, where you simply have individuals and societies, then the environment is out. And then you have to add, okay, yes, but we also want to add, you know, the speech, our speeches may be prone to extinction. How do we address that? Okay. It seems to me that still, there's something appealing in, in an ontological shift that enables us to emphasize both the specificity 
of some uh, uh, logic of oppression, but also uh, the ontological underpinning and why there are such a multiplicity of forms of oppression constantly intersecting with each other. Um, and I guess, sorry, this is, I mean, that's really helpful. And, and I, I think as well, like having a sort of idea of an ontology that sort of opens up possibilities. Do you think trans, and this is just a short follow up, sorry. Do you think trans individuality opens itself up to a type of like, say like practical, like epistemological reworking? Like, like it, it's open for sort of a flexible, I don't know what I want to say, but like a more like, say like you have to like, change like your understanding of like a logic of domination or like a new concept emerges like does trans individuality as an ontology open up like have that flexibility i guess i, I think yes i think it does uh, because uh, precisely because it emphasizes that um the, the, the this plurality is not something that we uh, we have to add is something that is intrinsic in mechanism of domination from the very beginning. It is intrinsic in the fact that um, in contexts where certain people are oppressed, the entire society is oppressed. Why so? Well, because if women, um, it, 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 let's say if uh, um, even, even if, you, if you, even if you are not a woman, but you are a man uh, or uh, a, another gender non-conforming uh, person, the oppression of women as a category will bring back to you uh, some forms of oppression. I mean, uh, that may not, you may not be the one who's paying the highest price for that. So women will still be paying the highest price, but that very mechanism of oppression will come back uh, to you in a form or another. Why so? Because we are trans individuals, so you can't call yourself out of this web of life, mesh of life in which we are all part. So I think it, it does lead to a different understanding of uh, domination uh, and oppression. Okay, great. I think we have time for just one more question. And it, it actually brings us back to the very beginning, because it's a question about anarcho-feminism and COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So there's a question about what are some of the ways in which anarcho-feminism can help us think about disability in a new way? And how can this apply specifically to COVID-19? So, uh, the, yes. Disability is, is generally conceived as something that happens to some bodies uh, because the environment, uh, let's say, because it's intrinsic to the bodies. Some bodies are considered to be disabled in, in uh, comparison to others. If you look at it from the point of view of uh, um, an ontology of the trans individual, we see that the environment, which it is the environment itself, they turn some people and some bodies into disabled ones. So disability is not something that is intrinsic to the bodies, but it's a, a mechanism of association uh, between certain individuals and other individuals around it that make, they create um, forms of oppression uh, for people who are perceived as disabled. So disability is no longer a property of some bodies, uh, some individuals understood as independent substances, but it's what happens when uh, um, what Spinoza would call the conatus uh, of every individuality is diminished. Uh, the attempt to persevere in one's own being is diminished or hindered by a uh, um, deleterious encounter with other individuality. So I think there's an important shift here, uh, also in the sense that Spinoza's uh, conatus is at, is at times mistakenly uh, uh, interpreted as a form of just self-preservation. Here we don't have a self-preservation because every self-preservation also implies the preservation of others. Uh, so this preservation must be understood, if you want, as a form of equilibrium 
between the different networks that constitute our individuality. As a consequence, disability is not something that is the property of some bodies, but is something that we create at those uh, intersections um, where the, the striving to persist of some uh, individuals is hindered or uh, diminished by the societal uh, framework. Well, that's great. That brings us right back to the beginning. So thank you, Kiara. This was wonderful. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Okay, so this will be posted online and hopefully we'll continue the conversation. So thanks again and hope to see you all soon. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.